Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of Read With Me. I'm your truly Isabel Bedell, and I'm here to read with you this amazing, amazing book. It is The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John C. Maxwell. We are on Law of Addition, y'all. The Law of Addition. And I'm really, really excited about this because it's the law number five. And the number five to me is has always been a very special number. Now, the law that we went through yesterday was off the chain, okay? It was all about the lesson on navigation, okay? The law of navigation. And the story that he shared, it was equipped with so much power. You know, it was equipped with so much, how do I say this? Like rigor, right? Basically two different strategies to hit the South Pole. And one strategy was very carefully executed, carefully planned to the detail, understanding the dynamics of the elements of the of the earth, the sun, the snow, the frostbite, all of these things that, you know, happen. And the other one was planned, but not to the specific detail that it required for every single person on that mission to reach the South Pole. The first scenario got every single person. It was like five people on the first mission. They arrived to the South Pole, literally step by step by step, got to every point of the South Pole, and they were literally able to all of them make it to the South Pole. No frostbite, no complications. There was only one guy that got like a tooth infected, but you know, that's that's out of the whole mission, you know? Now, the second strategy, completely different, completely different. It was the same exact path, same exact path. They were going to the same exact place. It took them one month after the first strategy to actually arrive to the South Pole. <clears throat> By the time they got to the South Pole, two people were already like, to their last, last bit of life. And by the time they got to the South Pole and they were on their way back, their entire team, a group of five, literally passed away during that whole strategy, that whole mission, because of the lack of strategy from the second individual. I mean, it was like, it was like a movie, you know, because if you think about this in real life, I don't know about you, but I'm not trying to go to the South Pole, okay? But I am trying to lead a team. I'm trying to grow this business. I'm not only trying to grow my business, but I we have like four different departments within our organization. And in each organization, there's different levels of clientele from the people that are paying a very low amount per month to the people that are paying thousands and thousands of dollars, like hundreds of thousands of dollars per year. So how do I, how do I make sure that all of them are equipped for greatness? How do I equip them for, you know, the most seamless, seamless integration into, you know, the business world of systems and CRMs and automation and all that? And how do we make their life better? How can we add value to their life? That's the law of navigation. Being able to think of not only five moves ahead, mm -hmm. right? But then also implementing it as you mentioned, as you mentioned you were going to do it. It's one thing to say, I want to do something. I want to go to the, I want to go to the moon. I want to build the first electric car. I want to be able to give, computers to every single person in the world. Okay, well, how are you gonna do that? You have to take the time, true leaders, and this is what John C. Maxwell is saying, true leaders spend the time 
understanding what it is that they need to do so they can back it up through their actions. If you have influence today, ladies and gentlemen, if you have influence today and you're able to navigate through life with a strategy, a course in mind, so you can get to that point and bring a whole bunch of people with you and get to the destination and nobody got hurt and everybody's good and everybody's happy. Well, that's what John C. Maxwell considers a true leader, an effective leader. Not only that, a person of influence. Now, I don't know about you, but that speaks volumes. It speaks volumes. And if you're willing and able to be coachable and teachable within this book, you become limitless. And that's where I feel I am right now in my life, where like I've been searching for answers. I've been searching for guidance. I've been searching for wisdom. I've been seeking that. And because I am seeking that, I'm literally receiving it. So each one of these laws, I think this is the only book that has helped me to like really focus, but then also like, for example, the past couple of books, like your next five moves, uh, even a view from the top, um, they, they all kind of like pump you up, right? This book, calms you down and keeps you focused and centered which I really like because sometimes you just need to take a step back and not necessarily go crazy on things so the law of addition chapter number five that we're about to get into is where leaders add value by serving others so this is going to be a really really powerful one I'm confident that this is gonna just blow our you know, minds, but I'm confident that this will also repel any limiting beliefs that you might have right now. Whatever it is, maybe it is, uh, maybe I don't wanna hire uh, someone to come into my organization. Maybe I don't want to speak to that particular person, or maybe I don't wanna do that extra video, or maybe I don't want to, go to that one event or maybe I don't want to I don't want to do it up there's so many things that we don't want to do and it's understandable well what if we look at it through the lens of the law of addition okay so let's get into it I haven't read this chapter I'm just kind of like going with flow right now and going with you know what I feel is going to lead me to the answers for this book for this particular chapter in this book. Okay, so let's get into it. The law of addition. The law of addition, leaders add value by serving others. Okay. In a world where many political leaders enjoy their power and prestige and where CEOs of large corporations make astronomical in incomes, work, in, work and live in luxury, and appear to be most concerned with what's in it for them, Jim Senegal is an oddity. Senegal is a co-founder and CEO of Costco, the fourth largest retailer in the United States and the ninth in the world. He doesn't seem much interested in perks. He works in an unremarkable office compromise, primarily of folding tables and chairs. If he invites someone to meet him at the corporate offices, he goes down to the lobby to meet his guests. He answers his own phone and he takes a salary of only 250,000 a year, which puts him in the bottom 10% of CEOs of large corporations. Senegal's path to corporate leadership wasn't typical either. He didn't attend an Ivy League school. He isn't a lawyer or a CPA. As a teenager, he thought of becoming a doctor, but his high school grades were less than stellar. So he went off to community college and earned an associate's degree. While he was attending San Diego State College, now a university, he helped a friend unload mattresses at a new local retail store called Fed Mart. That one day of work turned into a regular job. 
and when he received the promotion, he discounted his studies. He had found his career, and in time, he had also found a mentor, Sol Price, FedMart's chairman. Under Price's guidance, Senegal rose to the post-executive vice president of merchandising. Senegal's later helped Price found Price Club, and then went on to co-found Costco in 1983 with Jeffrey H. Brotman. The company's growth was rapid. Costco purchased and merged with Price Club 10 years later, adding profits by adding value. Oof, this is gonna be a good one. Retail experts give a lot of attention to Senegal's formula for success. Offer, offer a limited number of items, rely heavy, rely on high volume sales, keep costs as low as possible and don't spend money on advertising. Wow, look at that. That's true, you never see a Costco commercial, but there's, or anything really, but there's something that separates him from the competitors to employ similar strategies. The way he treats his employees, he believes is paying his employees well in offering them good benefit packages. Costco employees are paid an average of 42% more than the company's chief rival. And Costco employs a fraction of the national average for healthcare. Senegal believes that if you pay people well, you get good people and good productivity. You also get employee loyalty. Costco has by far the lowest employee turnover rate in all of retailing. Nice. But Senegal's leadership style of adding value doesn't end with an employee compensation. He goes out of his way to show Costco workers that he cares about them. He maintains an open door policy with everyone. He wears an employee name tag, is on a first name basis with everyone and makes sure to visit every single Costco store at least once a year. No manager, no staff in any business feels very good if the boss is not interested enough to come see them, so cynical. And when he shows up, his people are always glad to see him. The employees know that I want to say hello to them because I like them. Senegal once flew from Texas to San Francisco area where he heard that a Costco executive was hosp hospital hospitalized for emergency surgery. It came as no surprise to the executive. It was consistent with the way Senegal always leads. Leadership lessons learned early. Soul Price, Senegal's one-time mentor, says, Jim has done a very good job in balancing the interests of the shareholders, the employees, the customers, and the managers. Most companies tilt too much one way or another, and many of the lessons Senegal learned from Price, who believed in treating people well and giving them credit, in a meeting at Fred Mark, Senegal noted that a manager was quick to take the credit card and to place blame on the others was quick to take the credit and to place blame on others, but Price saw it through him. To teach us all a lesson with Paul Sen Soul used a weekly meeting to purposely raise hell about something that was wrong in one of the stores. I wonder why he did it. But when he saw that this manager let two of his employees take the blame, he fired him within a week. It's improper for one person to take credit when it takes so many people to build a successful organization. When you try to be the top dog, you don't create loyalty. Yeah, I agree. If you can't give credit and take blame, you will drown in your inability to inspire. The only real criticism of cynical comes from Wall Street. Analysts there believe that cynical is too kind and generous to his people. They would, like, they would like to see him pay employees less and squeeze them more, but Senegal wouldn't think of it. He believes that if you treat the employees and customers right, profits will follow. And on Wall Street, he observes, they're in the business of making money between now and next Thursday. And I don't say that with any bitterness, but we can't take that view. We want to build a company 
that will be the here for the next 50 to 60 years. Others outside of their organization appreciate his approach to business. Nell Minow, an expert on corporate governance, remarked, I would love to clone him. Of the 2,000 companies in our database, he has a single shortest CEO employee contract. It's less than a page long. Or just long. The only which specifically says he can be, believe it or not, terminated for cause. When it comes down to it, cynical is focused on adding value to people by serving them then on serving himself or making himself richer with an exorbitant salary. He lives by the law of addition. I just think that if you're going to run an organization that's very cost conscious, then you can't have the disparities. Having an individual who is making 100, 200, or even 300 times more than the average person working on the floor is wrong. Cynical sums it up this way. This is not altruistic. This is good business. He could also say that it's good leadership. So do motives matter here? Why should leaders lead? And when they do, what is their first responsibility? And if you were to ask a lot of leaders, you might hear a variety of different responses. You might hear these. You might hear that a leader's job is to be in charge, make the organization run smoothly, make money for the shareholders, build a great company, make us better than the competition, and win. Well, does a leader uh, does a leader's motive matter, or is it simply getting the job done that's important? What's the bottom line? I didn't give it much thought until the last 10 years. I vividly remember teaching leadership to a group of government officials in the developing nation a few years ago and teaching that leaders add value by serving others. I could see that many of, many of the audience members looked very uncomfortable as I talked about it. And when I finished speaking and mentioned what I observed to one of the, bot, the hosts, he said, yes, I'm sure they did look uncomfortable, what you have to realize is that probably more than half of those people killed someone to obtain their current position of power. And I've seen and heard a lot of things around the world, but I must admit that I was shocked. In that moment, I realized that I could not take for granted why leaders lead with, why leaders lead and how they go about doing it. Do the math. Many people view leadership the same way that they view success, hoping to go as far as they can, climb the ladder, and achieve the highest position possible for their talent. But contrary to the conventional thinking, I believe that the bottom line in leadership isn't how far we advance ourselves, but how far we advance others. This is achieved by serving others and adding value to their lives. The interaction between every leader and follower is a relationship. And all relationships either add to or subtract from a person's life. If you are a leader, then trust me, you're having either a positive or a negative impact on the people you lead. How can you tell? Well, this one is a critical question. Are you making things better for the people who follow you? That's it. If you cannot answer with an unhesitant yes, and give some evidence that backs it up, then you may very well be a subcontractor. Often subcontractors don't really, don't realize that they are subcontracting from others. I would say that 90% of all people who subtract from others do so unintentionally. They don't recognize their negative impact on others. And when a leader is a subcontractor and doesn't change his ways, it's only a matter of time before his impact on others goes from subtraction to division. Wow. Wow, that's strong. In contrast, 
of all people who add value to others do so intentionally. Why do I say that? Well, because human beings are naturally selfish. I'm selfish. Being an adder, re adder requires me to get out of my comfort zone every day and think about adding value to others. But that's what it takes to be a leader whom others want to follow. Do that long enough, and you not only add value to others, but you begin to multiply it. Mm. The people who make the greatest difference seem to understand this. If you think about some of the people who have won the Nobel Peace Prize, for example, Aldo Streitzer, Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, the Bishop, Desmond Tutu, you see leaders who were less interested in their position and more interested in their positive impact to others. If you read their writings, or more importantly, study their lives, you notice that they wanted to make things better for others and to add value to people's lives. They didn't set out a, they didn't set out to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. They desired to engage in noble service to their fellow human beings. A servant's mindset per pervades their thinking. The 1952 prize winner, Albert Schweitzer, advised, seek always to do some good somewhere. Every man has to seek it in his own way to realize his true worth. You must give some time to your fellow man, for remember, you won't you don't live in a world all on your own. Your brothers are here too. Adding value to others through service doesn't just benefit the people being served. It allows the leaders to experience the following, fulfillment in leading others, leadership with the right motives, the ability to perform significant acts of leaders, the development of the leadership team and attitude of service on the team. Mm -hmm. The best place for a leader isn't always the top position. It isn't the most prominent or powerful place. It's the place where he or she can serve the best and add the most value to other people. And Albert Einstein, who was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1921, asserted, only a life lived in the service of others is worth living. Great leadership means great service. How do leaders serve people? Jim Senegal pays good wages and treats employees with respect. Martin Luther King marched for civil, civil rights. Mother Teresa cared for the sick and established places where others could do the same. The specifics depend on the vision, the type of work, and the organization. But the intention is always the same, to add value. When you add value to people, you lift them up, you help them in advance, and you make them a part of something bigger than yourself and assist them in becoming who they were made to be. Often their leader is the only person able to help them do those things. Strong. Adding value, changing lives. I have developed four guidelines to help me add value to others, and three of them are foundational, fundamental, and can be used by anyone desiring to practice the law of addition. The fourth is based on my faith. So if you might get offended, you or you don't have interest in that area, then simply skip it, okay? Got it? We're good? Good. Here's number one. We add value to others when we truly value others. Daryl Hartley Leonard, who retired as a chairman of the board of Hyatt Hotels Corporation is currently chairman and chief executive officer of the production group International. He says, when a person moves into a position of authority, he or she gives up the right to abuse people. Ooh. I love that. I love that line. I believe that is true. But that is only the beginning of good leadership. Effective leaders go beyond not harming others, and they intentionally help others. To do that, they must value people and demonstrate that they care in such a way that their followers know it. Dan Rillen, who was 
my right hand man for many years is an excellent leader and values people highly. But when he first came to work for me, he didn't show it. One day when he was on, when he was new on the job, I was chatting with some people in the lobby and Dan came in in a briefcase in hand. Dan walked right past all of us without saying a word and went straight down the hall towards his office. I was astounded. How could a leader walk right by a group of people he worked with and not even say hello to them? I quickly excused myself from the conversation I was having and followed Dan to his office. And I was like, Dan, I asked him after greeting him, how could you walk right past everybody like that? Dan answered, I've got a lot of work to do today and really want to get started. But Dan, I said, you just walked past your work. Never forget that leadership is about people. Dan cared about people and wanted to serve them as a leader. He just didn't show it. I'm told that in American Sign Language, the sign for serving is to hold the hand out in front of you with the palms up and move and move them back and forth between the signer and the signee. And really, that is a good metaphor for the attitude of the servant leader should possess. They should be open, trusting, caring, offering their help, and willing to be vulnerable leaders who add value by serving, believe, in their people before their people believe in them and serve others before they are served. Here's number two, we add value to others when we make ourselves more valuable to others. The whole idea of adding value to other people depends on the idea that you have something of value to add and you can't give what you do not possess. What do you have to give to others? Can you teach skills? Can you give opportunities? Can you give insight and perspective gained through experience? None of these things comes without a price. If you have skills, you gain them through study and practice. If you have opportunities to give, you acquired them through hard work. If you possess wisdom, you gained it by intentionally evaluating the experiences that you've had. The more intentional you have been in growing personally, the more you have to offer, the more you continue to pursue personal growth, and the more you will continue to have to offer. I love that one. We add value to others when we know and relate to what others value. This, this is a good one. Management consultant Nancy K. Austin says, that once we, once she looked under the bed in her room at one of her favorite hotels, she was surprised to find a card. It said, yes, we clean under here too. Austin said, I don't remember the lobby or the number of chandeliers or how many square feet of marble they co cobbled together to make our underfoot experience pleasant, but she remembered that card. The housekeeping staff had anticipated what that, what was important to her and had served her well. The housekeeping staff had anticipated, anticipated, key word right here, anticipated what was important to her and had served her well. If you can anticipate what's gonna happen, you are now becoming the master of your life, your business and your relationships as strong. We think, of that as good customer service. And when we are clients or guests, we expect to receive it. But as leaders, we don't automatically expect to give it. But it is a key to effective leadership. As leaders, how do we know and relate to what our people value? Well, we listen. Inexperienced leaders are quick to lead before knowing anything about the people they intend to lead. But mature leaders listen, they learn, and they lead. They listen to their people's stories. They find out about their hopes and dreams. 
They become acquainted with their aspirations and they pay attention to their emotions. From those things they learn about their people, they discover what is valuable to them, and then they lead based upon what they've learned. When they do that, everybody wins. In the organization, the leader and the followers, they win too. I freaking love that one. Two and three are like yin and yang. I love this one so much. Even hearted it. We listen. And then number four, we add value to others when we do things that God values. Now, I already mentioned to you that you may want to skip this final point, but for me, it's a non-negotiable. And I believe that God desires us to not only treat people with respect, but also to actively reach out to them and serve them. Scripture provides many examples and descriptions of how we should conduct ourselves. But here's my favorite. It's captured by Eugene Peterson's The Message. When he finally arrives, blazing in beauty, and all his angels with him, with him, the Son of Man will take his place on the glorious throne. Then all the nations will be arranged before him, and he will sort the people out, much as the shepherd sorts out sheep and goats, putting sheep to his right and goats to his left. The king will say to those on the right, enter. You who are blessed by my father, take what's coming to you in the kingdom. It's been ready for you since the world's foundation and here's why. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and then you gave me a drink. I was homeless and you gave me a room. I was shivering and you gave me clothes. I was sick and you stopped to visit and I was in prison and you came to me. Then those sheep are going to say, Master, what are you talking about? When did you, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we ever see you sick or in prison and came to you? Then the king will say, I'm telling the solemn truth. Whenever you did those, whenever you did one of those things to someone overlooked or ignored, that was me. And you did it to me. The standard for my conduct influences everything that I do, and not just including my leadership, but especially my leadership. Because the more power that I have, the greater my impact on others, and for better or worse. And I always want to be someone who adds value to others, not takes it away. It's not just about the chink. When I moved my companies and my family to Atlanta in 1997, it wasn't long before I received a call from Dan Cathy, the president of Chick-fil-A, the privately held national restaurant chain. He had a question for me. John, how can we help you and your organization? I was surprised. How often does a company that's bigger and stronger than you come seemingly out of the blue and offer a hand to help? But that's what Dan did. He brought together 200 top business people from Atlanta and hosted a lunch, a lunch where we introduced, where he introduced me and offered me a chance to speak to them for 40 minutes. It gave me instant credibility that it would have taken me years to earn. If indeed it, I could have earned it all without his help. He added tremendous value to me and my organization. What I discovered as I got to know Dan, Truett Kathy, his father, and founder of Chick-fil-A and their entire organization is that an attitude of service pervades everything that they do. And for that reason, along with dedication to excellence, I have to say that Chick-fil-A is one of the companies that I most greatly admire and respect. In 2005, when I hosted it, when I hosted Exchange a Weekend Leadership Growth Experience for Executives, I took the participants to Chick-fil-A's headquarters south of Atlanta. Everyone got to see a company's operations, meet Truett Cathy, and hear Dan Cathy speak about the organization. He shared many eye-opening comments that revealed their dedication to serving, to service and adding value to their employees and customers. So for example, Dan was preparing 
that day to camp out with customers for the 19th time on the eve of a new restaurant opening. He said that he has gotten to know customers and their desires in a way that he never could before he started the practice. Dan also talked about the company's desire to give second mile service because Chick-fil-A is a privately held company and is much smaller than McDonald's, KFC, and many of the other competitors. He believes that company will compete and win, not through strength, but through service. So for that reason, the company is teaching etiquette to its employees, many of whom are teenagers and Dan Jones. There's evidence that the words etiquette and fast food have never been mentioned in the same sentence before. But Dan's approach to leadership became clear when he prepared to give every person at the exchange what he called a leadership relationship development tool. Dan said, now, this is a nine inch, 100% coarse hair shoe brush. This is an industrial strength shoe brush. It's the best that you can get from Johnston and Murphy Shoes Company. I'm going to present all of these, one to each of you here. And John, why don't you come over here just for a moment? I made a commitment. I'd never give one of these leadership relationship development tools to anybody without first showing you how to use it. So John, step up here so they can see you here. And I'm going to challenge you to watch closely. This really has substance and real meaning when it's practiced with people that you've really known, that you've really worked with a lot. So if you let me show you how this happens, I'll tell you how it works. Dan sat me down, kneeled at my feet, and began cleaning my shoes with a brush. Now, this works whether the person's got tennis shoes, Nikes, Reeboks. It will work on any type of shoe. So don't you worry about what kind of shoes the person has on. You don't say anything. That's one of the keys, the real keys here. And you're in no big hurry as you do this. Then when you're done, you give them a big hug. At this point, Dan stood up, gave me a big hug, and then turned to address the crowd once again. I find that in the right setting, when you have enough time to do this and to really talk about this, this can have a powerful impact on people's lives. And I believe that this does it, clean out the closet in our relationship with other people. Such a big part of leadership is having no unresolved relational conflict with other people and serving others who follow you really purifies your motives and helps you gain perspective. And it also brings to the surface any impure motives of followers Anytime that you can remove wrong agendas from a leadership relationship, you clear the way for fantastic achievement. And when True and Kathy answered some questions at the end of our time with them, he quoted Ben Franklin as saying, the handshake of the host affects the taste of the roast. Hmm. Another way to say it, would be that the attitude of the leader affects the atmosphere of the office. The attitude of the leader affects the atmosphere of the office. And if you desire to add value by serving others, you will become a better leader. And your people will achieve more, develop more loyalty, and have a better time getting things done than you ever thought possible. And that is the power of addition. Wow. What a what a clever way to show, you know, a way to serve others. You know, I know I know a lot of people are for Chick Fil A, but then there's a a group of people that are not for Chick Fil A based on whatever it is that they do, right, or what they're for. Um, actually, I've only had their fries or something, and they're really good but I'm grateful that I actually don't eat fast food, which is a blessing in its own. But I really enjoyed that, you know, because 
sometimes when you get to a certain level in business, <clears throat> you, especially if you've never experienced it, I know I've done this and I, I'm looking back on it, I'm like, what were you thinking, Isabel? It was like, you get to a certain level and then people start throwing you accolades and you feel like you've, you've got it. Like you, you've, you've reached a certain level within your career and because you did it, like no one else like told you what to do. Like you created that momentum. You start believing the hype. You start believing all the accolades and instead of receiving the accolades and feeding your leadership, feeding your, um, your wisdom, feeding your patience, feeding your hunger, it starts feeding a different side of you that might not be in essence and in reality for you. So um, I feel like when you get to a point in, in business where like you have achieved a certain level of success, it's not, it should never be difficult to, you know, another in a, like a physical, you know, representation shine someone else's shoes because it just shows the ability for you to mold into a whole new level, a whole new scope, a whole new threshold within yourself. And you, when you don't take yourself as serious, you have the ability to connect with people even deeper because you're not, um, you're not like, what is the word that I'm looking for? You're not bashing someone else's current state you know I don't think I've ever bashed anyone or like thought myself as like oh I'm the greatest or whatever but I I have gotten to a point in my life in the past where I was like oh we're good we got this like nothing's gonna stop us you know this like cocky confidence and to a degree it helped me for sure because it was the first time ever getting to a point in business where like we're earning more than my entire life combined in one month you know or you know my mom is was our accountant and like she's looking at her tax return and she's like what the hell you know so it's like and we're like yeah we did that like Vanessa and I did that together you know when everything was against us like we literally left our home our security our friends our family our jobs and to start something brand new in a country where no one spoke English and in the first two years of our business we became we became unstoppable in the sense of like we we burned all the bridges, we bought, not bridges, all the boats, and we had to make something happen. And we tapped into our most God-given abilities and skill sets, and we made it happen. That's what I wish for everyone, is to have the confidence within yourself to just take your life to the next level. And I'm so excited for what's coming um, because with all these books, like, I just feel like, and I'm going to be very transparent with you guys, because I think it's important. If you're not able to speak it, then you're just holding things in. And sometimes, yes, it's good to hold things in and then just say it whenever the time is right. But I'm going to share with you something that's in my heart right now after reading this. And oh, shit, it's been five chapters already. And this guy, John... Maxwell is like just speaking to my soul okay I really 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 hope if you're younger you know I think if you're not close to books if you're not reading like physical books it's the biggest disservice that you can do for yourself just audiobooks and doing all that it's not going to get you to where you want to go. It's like meeting someone in person. I remember when I first, like uh, for two whole straight years, we were um, 
you know, Grant, Grant Cardone, he was like the mentor. Like we first started with Gary V and then Gary V was like, work for free. And we're like, uh, we need to pay for rent. And then Grant Cardone was like, go out there, charge what you got and go for it and keep doing it and 10 exit. You know, we followed that advice for 10, for, for two years straight. And thank God that we did because when I finally saw him and we're, we're like, he's a little bit taller. He's like literally the height of my, my bone or whatever. I was like, he's real. Like we sat in the front row at the conference in London and he spoke directly to Vanessa and me. And I was like, shit, man, you're a real guy. You're a real person. Like his hand, I saw his hands, they were real. And I was like, if you had that impact on me, I know for sure I can have the impact that I envision for others. And that took our business to the next level for sure. For sure. I'm going to end it with this. I know this was a very deep conversation, but I, if you do resonate with this, you know, throw a, throw a like or whatever, but this is more of a message for you. You know, hopefully my children see this and they're like, oh, wow, like mom had the feels on this episode or whatever, but like, yeah, when you're growing, your emotions, your attitude, your vision, it there's so much more clarity behind it. So that's that's what I hope for you. I'm gonna end it with the three different ways for you to apply the law of addition to your life. Do you have a servant's attitude when it comes to leadership? Don't be too quick to say yes. Here's how you can tell. In situations where you are required to serve, serve others' needs, how do you respond? Do you become impatient? Do you feel resentful? Do you believe that certain tasks are beneath your dignity or position? If you answer yes to any of those questions, then your attitude is not as good as it could be. Make it a practice to perform small acts of service for others without seeking credit or recognition for them and continue until you no longer resent doing them. Number two, what do the people closest to you value? Make a list of the most important people in your life from home, work, church, hobbies, and so on. And after making the list, write what each person values most. Then rate yourself on a scale of one poorly and 10 excellently on how you relate to that person's values. And if you can't articulate what someone values or you score lower than an eight in relating to that person, then spend more time with him or her to improve it. And lastly, number three, make adding value part of your lifestyle. Begin with those closest to you. How could you add value to the people on your list related to what they value? Start doing it. Then do the same with all the people that you lead. If there are only a few, add value individually. And if you lead large numbers of people, you may have to think of ways to serve groups as well as individuals. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, that concludes chapter number five, the law of addition from John C. Maxwell, 21 Irreputable Laws of Leadership. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you got some value. I shared some important things about my life because it came from my heart to yours. And I'm proud of it. I'm proud of who I'm becoming. I'm proud of where this whole entire journey is taking me. And I'm proud of what's being created because I know it's for me. I know it's for you. I know it's for all of us. So may you have a blessed day. May you continue to strive forward and may you continue to be a servant of life and to be the learner of the world. Bye.